Hi divers, Alec Pierce again, Scuba 2000. I'm here with another uh, hopefully interesting video about vintage scuba. I've been diving for 58 years. Interesting enough, uh, this is 2016. I started diving in 1958. And uh, it's been a fantastic, just a fantastic journey for me. Uh, I've loved every minute of it. Uh, uh, obviously, in all those years, I've seen a lot of changes in the scuba gear. In the 50s, we made our own scuba gear, a lot of it. There weren't very many dive stores, so you had to make it, or you, uh, you read magazines and, and ordered it. My first pair of fins I ordered from, uh, from uh, Jamaica, New York. It's in Queens. And it was a pretty fascinating experience I've had. So I want to share some of this with you. I think it's important and interesting, I hope, that for you to understand that the, where the modern gear came from. That somebody didn't sit down and design a modern BC or a modern weight belt. It actually developed sometimes with some interesting consequences along the way. So hopefully these Venti Scuba uh, episodes will be interesting for you. Before we start on this particular one, I had hinted earlier in one of my earlier Venti Scuba that I had a lot of weird stuff. So I'm going to show you just two weird things today. Over the years, there's been a lot of weird stuff. Now, at the time when it first came out, we said, wow, that's pretty neat. And there was, some of us actually bought the stuff and actually tried to use it. And then we discovered, wow, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, or it's dangerous, or it doesn't allow whatever. So that's what we call weird stuff, stuff that appeared and disappeared right away. Some of it was pretty interesting. Let me show you an example here. This is what we call a scuba com. Scuba com. You could buy one of these or two of these. It made more sense to get a couple of them because it was always nice if you said something to your buddy and he could talk back. But this is a neat little device uh, packed up in your dive bag made of plastic. It's got a rubber diaphragm on the front. You can just see a hint of the rubber diaphragm through the front and a mouthpiece on the back to seal against your mouth like this and a couple of exhaust ports and it was pretty neat. This actually allowed you to talk to your dive buddy. So if you wanted to, you could put this up against your mouth. Now, you may not uh, understand this completely, but in order to talk underwater, you need to have an airspace in front of your mouth and a diaphragm. There has to be an airspace. That's the difficulty But trying to talk underwater. Normally, you're talking into the, into the water. That doesn't work. You need to have an airspace. So in order to make this scuba con work, uh, calm work, and it's pretty big in there, you actually had to clear the water out. Yeah, and that was, that's why the exhaust, the little exhaust valves are on the back, you see here. So you had to take a great big breath. And of course, you remember the most important uh, rule in scuba diving, never hold your breath. So you take a great big breath of air, hold it, <laughs> take your regulator out, and then you had to exhale that breath into the scuba com. And that filled the scuba com up with air. Uh, and, and the water that was in there came out through the exhaust port. So once you got this full of air, now you have your mouth, your voice, airspace, and a diaphragm, so you could talk. It was kind of like this. Hey, Kevin, Kevin, can you hear me? Come on, oh, oh hey, Kevin. <laughs> and you clear your regulator, get it back in your mouth to start to breathe again. It was pretty interesting, but you know what? It actually sort of worked. And if you had two divers and they practiced a whole lot, uh, this, this, this silly little communication device would work. And there was another one that came out too. This was uh, called the Sea Voice. Not quite as old as the Scuba Com. This, I'm going to guess, this was probably from the 70s, thereabouts, late 70s, or maybe even into the 80s. I'm not exactly sure. And uh, and uh, again, you buy one or buy two of these. It worked almost exactly the same, but it was a little better. Yeah. <clears throat> With this particular one, there's a lanyard on it, as you can see. With this particular one, that has, there's, there's a big diaphragm, you see? And you could fold the diaphragm up a little bit. It wouldn't take as much air to clear it. So you have the same, same process. Take a big breath on your regulator. <gasps> take your regulator out and put this against your mouth and blow. <gasps> hey, come on. Come on. Can you hear me? <laughs> Back you went. <laughs> Pretty weird devices. But they actually sort of half work if your diver, if your buddy wasn't too far away and you practiced a little bit, learned to talk slowly in strong syllables, then very often you could hear what you were saying. You caught that, did you? Very often. Anyway, it was a lot of fun. Let's talk about weights. And then the reason I want to talk about this briefly is I had a couple of questions, a couple of comments. Uh, one really caught my interest. Somebody wrote in and said, <clears throat> How did you compensate? for your change in buoyancy before co buoyancy compensators? Well, that is a very intelligent question. Today we have buoyancy compensators. And we're going to talk about buoyancy compensators in another vintage in just a little while. But before buoy buoy buoyancy compensators, we didn't. We had no kind of vest at all. We had a tank and a regulator and a weight belt, and off we went. So it was a good question. 
how did we compensate for the change in weight? You know, as you go deeper and your wetsuit starts to compress, you get heavier and heavier and heavier. How come we didn't end up stuck to the bottom? Well, first of all, there's a bit of a hint right there. Where do you think that the quick release buckle came for weight belts? You know, way back in the 50s and 60s. Because sometimes, if you weren't very careful, you would get stuck on the bottom. And you could kick all you want, and you wouldn't start to rise, and you had to dump that weight belt and you know, hopefully get back to the surface. But how did we actually make it more comfortable and easier for us to compensate? Before we do that, let's take a look at some of the modern uh, uh, weight belt systems. Some things haven't changed too much. This is a modern weight belt, okay? Brightly colored plastic, cyclac actually, material for the belt. There's not too many metal buckles left anymore. The cyclac material is virtually, it is in fact unbreakable, lifetime guaranteed. So this is a typical weight belt. And onto that weight belt, you, you put weights, just like the old days. The weights have changed a little bit. These are what we call bullet weights. And then they come in different sizes. There's a two pound and that's a three pound bullet weight. And you notice that they're coated with, uh, with uh, plastic now. It, it, it is nice, they're nicely colored. So you can coordinate all your diving gear and make them bright if you choose yellow. You can get any color you want. Uh, but there's another reason for that. As you know, lead is not good for the environment. And in the recent years, the last 10 or 15 years, there's been an attempt to try to get lead out of the environment, to not introduce raw lead to the environment. And that's what these are for. This is all we sell. All, all, a lot of professional dive stores will sell. They won't sell uncoated lead lead metal weights anymore. So that's pretty typical. You thread these on the belt and you have a system not unlike what we had uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. There are also newer weights available which are pretty neat. These are shot weights. So there's a five pound shot weight. Now if you had a five pound weight and you dropped it on your hand like that, it would hurt. But with these shot weights, uh, they're very flexible. They're still five pounds. I mean, five pounds is five pounds, but they're flexible and soft, and they're nice in your buoyancy compensator. You know, with modern buoyancy compensators, you can put your weights in the BC, so you don't have as many in the weight belt. We're going to talk about that in a little while. And these come in different weights, three pounds and two pounds and so on. And they're awfully nice, and, and even they even come in an ankle weight. So you, as a lot of people do, particularly if you use a dry suit, but even with wetsuits, if you have a problem and your feet keep going up to the surface, you can actually put on these little shot-filled ankle weights to help keep your feet under the water so you can fin properly. So modern weights uh, are, are pretty neat. They're, they're colorful, they're durable, they last forever, and they do a great job. But they did come from, from old-fashioned weight belts. Let's take a look at an old-fashioned weight belt. Now here's a very, very old weight belt. And the early weight belts were, they used the materials that we had on hand. First of all, raw lead. So that's just a hunk of lead that's been molded to fit. And uh, the belt itself is, is just, a, it's just a very thin, it's a one-inch webbing. And, uh, and you could purchase, although a lot of divers, myself included, used to make the quick release buckles. This is a, an interesting one, a very common design. I have several of these in smaller and larger sizes, and some of them are chrome plated. But on, on the one side, you see it's just a loop, just a loop. On this side over here, there's this, uh, there's this hook. And if you put the hook into the loop like that, put the belt on, it stayed there. But when you, if you needed to get rid of it in a hurry, you could just pull on the loop and it would fall apart. See how easy that works? Like that, it's easy. <laughs> Supposed to anyway, it would just fall apart. So that's a, a typical example of an early weight belt. Now this is a small weight belt. I mean, not too many weights on it. And, and so it was probably used in, well, if you were diving down in, uh, in a warm water where you didn't need as many weights. Uh, as weight belts developed and became more sophisticated, the belt got bigger. So now we have even modern weight belts, this fairly common two inch uh, web size. The weights are similar, similar. These, these are uh, th pass through weights, they were called, because they have two holes and you have to thread the buckle through them, which, which works pretty well. It uses a buckle. And this particular belt, <coughs> also has a, an interesting buckle. Now, they don't make this anymore. It was pretty handy at the time though. It's, it has a hook on this side and, and, and an interesting hole over here. And what you would do is you would pass the hook through the hole like so, and when you pulled it, it would snap in place, you see? And that held the whole thing together. And when you wanted to get rid of it, you would just lift on this and it would fall apart. Because again, remember, uh, in the old days when we didn't have buoyancy compensators, if you got stuck on the bottom, you had to be able to dump your weight belt easier. The very earliest weight belt didn't have any of these fancy buckles. It just had a loop. We would take the, the, the loose end, run it through, back through, and back again. So there'd be a piece hanging out in front. And you just yanked on that end of the belt, and the whole thing came apart. Uh, and, and, uh, but pretty, pretty quickly, 
we started to get these different types of hooks. This hook was pretty popular. And you notice, by the way, on this hook, down the bottom, there's a little hook on the bottom. That was for fastening various things on. You could, you could hook uh, uh, other tools and things on that little device down there. So, you know, it was interesting because even back in the 50s, this is from the 50s and early 60s, uh, divers were starting, uh, companies and divers were starting to think about making the equipment a little better for scuba diving. We weren't just using war surplus belts and weights the way we did when we first started. This is exactly the same type of hook, but you see this one's nicely chrome plated. You see, I lift, lift this and it falls apart like so. And so it's the same thing, but chrome plated, same hook on the bottom. This belt is different in one respect, and these were actually pretty common back in, in the early days of scuba. This is made of rubber. Look, it stretches. This was called, to be technical, this was called a depth compensating weight belt. Mm, big, a big uh, description that really means it stretches. So if you're on the surface, you could pull this belt really tightly around your body, and then as you went deeper and your wetsuit compressed from the pressure, the weight belt would start to relax a little bit, but it wouldn't fall off because a rubber weight belt would compensate for the depth. Ah, it sort of worked. However, let's go back to the original question. How did we uh, uh, work the weight so that we didn't end up on the bottom, stuck in the bottom, and, and we could get up and down? Well, it was really very simple. In the early days of scuba diving, when you had a weight belt, which you had to have, but no buoyancy compensator, you had to decide what depth you were going to be diving at before the dive. Now today, you jump in and you go to 10 feet, and you go to 30 feet, and you go to 60 feet, and come back up to 40, all over the world, all, all over the, the, it doesn't matter what depth you're at, because you just, a little bit of air in the BC, if you get too deep, dump a bit out when you're, we couldn't do that. So we had to decide what depth we were going to be diving at. For example, I want to make a dive to 30 feet, okay? So I knew from experience, largely from experience, diving, how many weights I needed to dive at 30 feet. Let's say I needed to have 18 pounds of weights to dive comfortably at 30 feet, to stay at 30 feet, not shoot to the servers and not sink to the bottom. So I would put on 18 pound weight belt, okay? Jump on the water. 18 pound weight belt at the surface, I'd be floating like a cork. So then I would pick up a big rock from the shore. Yeah, so I'd pick up a nice eight or 10 pound rock and I hold that rock against my front and then I would start to go down. Let the air, you know, equalize and work my way down the shoreline, hopefully. In some cases, if you're diving from a boat, you would pull yourself down the anchor line. The point is, you put on the right amount of weight for 30 feet and then you would get to 30 feet. And if you calculated properly, and there were no computers and tables in those days, this was based on experience. When you got to 30 feet, you could drop the rock or let go of the anchor line, and it was perfect. And you could swim around at 30 feet. Now you can go up a little bit, but not too high, because if you got too high, you'd start to rise to the surface. And you could go down a little bit, but not too deep. If you went too deep, you'd get down 35 or 40 feet, you'd be too heavy, and you would start to sink like a stone. And sometimes you couldn't stop yourself from sinking, and that's why you had to drop the weight belt, hence quick release. You folks wear quick release weight belts because of the way diving was, because of the system I'm describing to you. Now, if you were going to be diving at 60 feet, you didn't need 18 pounds. You only needed 12 pounds. So you put on a 12 pound weight belt and take a bigger stone. And down you'd go, you work your way down, watching with your old fashioned depth gauge. I'll show you some depth gauges in, a, in another couple of episodes. Boy, they were pretty neat. Tubes, there were tubes with water in them. Anyway, and you get down to 60 feet, you'd let the rock go, and if everything was right, you'd stay at 60 feet. Pretty neat, huh? And if you went too deep, well, you start to sink. You started to rise, you'd be out of control. Now, it made diving, it made some of these things we do today uh, 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 not, it wasn't possible. For instance, today, you know, the good safe diving practices indicate or dictate that you should make a safety stop. And it's a great idea. I do it. And any, any modern diver does that. They try, anyway, to make a safety stop. At the end of the dive, they come up to about 15 feet. Typical, anyway, is a three-minute safety stop at 15 feet. So if you come up from, the, from wherever depth you're on, you come to 15 feet, and you would stop at 15 feet, right? As you're rising, the air expands. You let a bit of air to the BC, and you get the 15 feet a little bit more out. And pretty soon, you'd be neutral at 15 feet. And you would stay there for three, that's what you do. You stay for three, for three minutes, and then you come to the surface, and you're perfectly safe. We couldn't do that. If we were weighted for 60 feet, once we started to ascend, we're on our way to the surface. You can't stop. Because once you get up to 15 feet, now you're very buoyant. The wetsuit is expanded and any air spaces in your body. And now you're very buoyant. You're going to the surface. 
No way you could stop at 15 feet. Again, if you had an anchor line with a very heavy anchor, you might be able to do that, but we didn't. Number one, that 15 foot safety stop was not even thought of at that time. And secondly, for practical purposes, you couldn't stop anyway. Very difficult to stop. So you see, I hope you understand that concept. You put on the amount of weight that you need for the depth at which you're going to be diving. You take a big stone or something else to get down, you drop it at that depth, and you stay at that depth. It sounds very restrictive, but it really wasn't. It wasn't that bad. I actually used to have one of my early dive suits. I had a little table that was taped to my arm, and it had the depth and the amount of weight I needed. I rolled on there with a ballpoint pen, that's what we used to call them, right? Ballpoint pens. And you're right on 30 feet, 18 pounds, 60 feet, 12 pounds, and I have all the different depths on there. And that's the way I knew from experience how much weight to wear. So I forget who it was that asked about that question. That's how we compensated if you like, for different depths, different weights. Now, one practical problem with this, of course, was you had to keep changing your weight belt. And that got to be a real nuisance. So there were some very interesting weights available in those days. I'm going to show you a couple here. Here's a weight that you probably haven't seen. This, and then these, were, these were just different ideas that people tried. We had not settled on a standard weight. So now we have bullet weights and we have hip weights, and they're pretty standard. They're the same. Every dive store is the same. But you may have never seen these. This looks like a half an orange. And there's a slot through it, you see? So you could, you could put this on your weight belt, and you had a bunch of little circles on your weight belt. So that's one type of weight that you used. We had bullet weights back then, same bullet weight we use today. We didn't call them bullet weights. They were called cylinder weights. It's a different word for it, cylinder weights. But it really is the same as today's bullet weight. Another idea that came up at the time, they weren't all that popular. The standard weight was a standard weight. It was a two or three pound weight, just like this. Uh, this is a three pound weight with two slots in it. You put your belt through, and put enough of those on, and on you went. But it was a bit of a nuisance to change them. If you were diving at 30 feet and your buddy said, let's go to 40 feet, you had to take off some weights. Well, it's a bit of a nuisance, as it even is today sometimes, to change your weight belt. Today, you don't have to because you have the BC, right? Boyncha Compensator. We had to change the weight belt all the time. How do we do that? Well, it was pretty interesting. What you could do was take a standard weight, but by this version. You see this version? Looks to be standard, doesn't it? But in actual fact, if you have this particular weight belt with a, you see it? The N-shaped slot, you can actually put this weight onto a weight belt without sliding the weight off the end. I'm not sure if I can do it with this stiff weight belt, but you see what happens? You can push the weight belt through the slot, and that allows you to take the weight off, slide it down and pop it up. So you can take this weight off the middle of your weight belt without adjusting the other way. How about this for an idea? Here's a pretty slick idea. There's a weight, two pound weight, yep, two pounds, and it has a steel bar. <laughs> Look at that. So if you want to take the weight off, you just simply put it on like so under the weight belt. And there's your weight belt under the steel bar. Actually, to be honest, it goes the other way. You would feed this through that big slot <clears throat> like so. And then that steel bar falls down inside, pull it back on, and you've just changed your weight belt. Some neat ideas, huh? This is the kind of stuff we had. Again, these aren't around anymore because with buoyancy compensators, you don't need to change your weight belt very much. Diving is so much easier today than it used to be back in the 50s and 60s. Of course, we didn't know that. We didn't know they were doing it the hard way. We were doing it. That's what was available, and it was exciting. We were frogmen, and uh, all the excitement of, the, of this brand new exciting sport of scuba diving was ahead of it. It was a whole lot of fun. But it is interesting for me, 60 years almost of scuba diving, to take a look at and see how things have changed. And it's wonderful. You divers today are so lucky. The gear is fantastic. It's safe. It's comfortable. It's easy to use. You dive much more safely. And it's just fantastic. And I dive as well a great deal even today. And I enjoy it very much. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Uh, the couple of weird things I showed you earlier, I have lots of weird things. I'm going to make a point of showing you a couple of weird things if I can each time we have one of these vintage. And now I've answered uh, this gentleman's uh, question about how we adjusted our weights. That's exactly what we did. We adjusted the weight for the depth and made, made or worked how to get down and get back up. Some of these interesting things. I hope you've enjoyed this. Seen a couple of ideas and made you smile a little bit and made you appreciate what you have today with the modern equipment. Talk to you again soon. It's Alec Pierce from Scuba 2000 Vintage Scuba.